Electoral Reform Committee submits a 49 election reform recommendations. Barisa national support to Purikata National only involves its MPs and Assemblymen. Good afternoon, I'm Mohana Priya. Welcome to Updates at Noon. Police have set up roadblocks in four locations and closed 11 rat routes in Amanjaya, Sungai Patani, Qatar, following the implementation of the Administrative Enhanced Movement Control Order, EMCO. Kuala Muda Police Chief ACP Adzli Abu Shah said the roadblocks involved roads heading to Ampangan Height, in which housing areas in Malo, Kananga and Mawa Zone were put under the Administrative EMCO. He said barbed wire fences were installed at the administrative EMCO areas, while concrete blocks were placed to close the rat tracks. The Kuala Muda police chief added that the EMCO areas would be manned by 26 police personnel and 93 officers, as well as six armed forces and 16 RELA members. Malaysians can now see for themselves the behind-the-scene efforts by the frontliners in the country's battle to break free from COVID-19 in a short video produced by the Health Ministry in conjunction with the National Month celebration. The YouTube link of the 10-minute video was shared by Health Director General Tan Sri Dr. Nur Hisham Abdullah on his Facebook account. Among those featured in the video were Tansri Dr. Noor Hisham himself, along with his War General, Deputy Director General of Health Medicine Come Crisis Preparedness and Response Centre Advisor, Tato Dr. Rohaizat Yon, and other medical heroes. The video also depicted the advancement of the CPRC as the coordination centre in the fight against the pandemic. Tansri Dr. Noor Hisham expressed hope that the short documentary could inspire Malaysians to continue to work together by playing their respective roles in fighting the COVID-19 as well as to follow the standard operating procedure set to break the virus chain. The Electoral Reform Committee, ERC, yesterday submitted 49 recommendations on electoral reform to Prime Minister Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin for the purpose of improving the system. Its chairman, Tan Sri Abdul Rashid Abdul Rahman, said the Premier, when receiving the report at his office in Parliament, has given the assurance that the government would look into all the recommendations thoroughly. Tansri Abdul Rashid said there was no time frame set for the government to implement the recommendations submitted. Dimuat sama dalam laporan itu ialah syur-syur berkaitan dengan langkah-langkah yang sesuai yang perlu dipertimbangkan bagi melaksanakan seberapa yang boleh dan dalam jangka masa yang sesuai. Sur-sur yang telah dikemukakan. However, he said 32 of the recommendations can be implemented within three years if approved by the government, while the rest may take between five and ten years to materialise. Tansri Abdul Rashid said among the recommendations was to separate the functions of the Election Commission into three bodies to boost public confidence in the EC. He said EC would remain as the main body in enforcing election laws. The Election Secretariat would conduct the election process, while the Commission for Redelineation of Electoral boundaries would be responsible for administrating certain matters related to the redelineation exercise. ERC was established in August 2018 to study the existing electoral system and laws. 
The Kuala Lumpur High Court yesterday allowed the prosecution's application to amend the forfeiture notice against hundreds of handbags of various brands, as well as cash, watches and 27 cars that were seized from former Prime Minister Datuk Sri Najib Tun Razak, his wife Datin Sri Rosmah Mansor and 16 others. Judge Mohamad Zaini Mazlan allowed the application after Deputy Public Prosecutor Fatin Hadni Khairuddin informed the court that the prosecution would amend the notice of forfeiture and make corrections in three supporting affidavits to support the notion, the notice of motion. Fatin Hadni said the amendment was also necessary due to errors in the bank account number, account type, bank name and branch, as well as the date of seizure on the notice of motion and the supporting affidavits. Meanwhile, lawyer Fazreen Hazrina Rahim, representing Datuk Sri Najib, said the respondent did not object to the prosecution's application, but requested that the process of gazetting the notice to a third party be expedited. Lawyers for the other respondents also did not object to the prosecution's application. The gazetting of the third-party notice is to enable interested parties to appear before the court to provide reasons on why the assets should not be forfeited by the government. The court set 4th September for case management. Barisan National Chairman Datuk Sri Dr Ahmad Zaid Hamidi has stressed again that the support given by the party to the Perikatan National or PN government only involves the support from BN members of parliament and assemblymen, not its component parties. He said this in response to the announcement made by MIC that it would not be joining PN as its component party but will continue to support the leadership of the current government. Ini berarti biarpun Perikatan Nasional itu telah mungkin didaftarkan dan disahkan perubuhannya tetapi MIC bukan lagi sebagai anggota pro-time komiti atau jatuh kuasa penaja kepada Perikatan Nasional. Earlier, MIC Secretary General Datu M. Asojan Muniandi was reported as saying that the party had initially agreed to join PN on the assumption that BN and AMNO would do the same. Meanwhile, Datu Sri Dr. Ahmad Zaid said he had informed Prime Minister Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin that AMNO and Parti Bersatu Rakyat Sabah (PBRS) candidates will be using BN logo in the Sabah state election next month. The Sabah election involves 1.12 million voters and has been set on 26th September with a nomination on 12th September and early voting on 22nd September. The Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs Ministry in Kedah seized 212,040 kilograms of subsidised fertiliser worth 287,000 ringgit in a raid on a warehouse in Jalan Kumbar, Alustar. Its enforcement chief, Mohamed Shahran Mohamed Arshad, said a man believed to be the warehouse worker in his 40s was arrested for further investigations. Mohamed Sharan said investigations also found that the surplus of subsidised fertiliser was bought from farmers around the area to be repackaged and sold around Alostar. He said it was believed that the subsidised fertiliser was bought at about 20 ringgit per bag before being repackaged and sold at more than 100 ringgit for each bag weighing 50 kilograms. Based on the information gathered, he said the warehouse is believed to have been operating for the past 20 years and the case is being investigated under Section 20 subsection 1 of the Control of Supplies Act 1961. The Kadar, KPD and HEP are conducting further investigation to track down the warehouse owner. 
Asia Gruber Hud is calling on ASEAN leaders in green zone countries to be brave and relook at reopening borders. Expressing hope for a green lane such as that set up by Malaysia and Singapore, Group Chief Executive Officer Tan Sri Tony Fernandez said as the number of COVID-19 cases has reduced, it is an opportunity for other countries such as Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos to slowly and carefully relook at opening their borders without too much risk. So I hope, you know, if you, think, if you look at Thailand, which has less than 10 people a day, if you look at Malaysia, which has, you know, done a great job, less than 10 people a day, um, why can't Malaysia and Thailand have a green lane? It's no different from flying to KK or Penang. Penang is just on the border of Thailand anyway, right? Um, so I hope we take some small steps, uh, careful steps, um, to start reopening international borders. Tansri Tony Fernandez was met after launching Air Asia Shop in KL Central. He also expected that there would be no international travel until the end of this year. But Air Asia is always prepared for any decisions taken by the government, including border reopening. He also hoped Air Asia would not have to undergo another downsizing, as travel demand would likely normalize by January next year. Malayan Banking Brahad or Maybank's net profit fell to 941.73 million ringgit for the second quarter and at 30th June 2020, hit by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic compared with 1.94 billion ringgit recorded in the same period last year. Revenue declined to 11.79 billion ringgit from 13.05 billion ringgit previously. The bank said net fund-based income for the quarter came in lower by 326.5 million ringgit compared with the same period last year, mainly as a result of the day one modification loss arising from the blanket moratorium for fixed rate financing and the 50 basis points cut in the overnight policy rate. That there might be a further cut of 25 basis points. If that happens, uh, you know, of course, uh, the, it will benefit uh, the, the fixed income uh, that we have in our books, uh, uh, depending on how it's reflected on the yield itself uh, in the first place. But um, as far as name is concerned, because the two impact, right? One is the name, the one, one is on the bond. Uh, if that happens, um, then it might have a negative impact on name of about one to two basis points. Now. Nevertheless, he said Maybank's strategy in maintaining superior liquidity and capital levels has assisted the bank greatly and it would continue to maintain a strong balance sheet in order to have the capacity to pursue business opportunities when the cycle picks up. On automatic moratorium, which is expiring on 30th September, he noted that the number of customers that had approached Maybank for further assistance program is still very small. He said the customers who had been unemployed because of COVID-19, Maybank could could offer the same kind of moratorium until the end of the year. While those whose income had been reduced, their repayment schedule can be worked out based on the reduction and repayment capability. BIMB Holdings Berhad has posted a lower net profit of 153.03 million ringgit in the second quarter and at 30th June 2020 from 195.16 million ringgit in the same period last year. Revenue also declined to 1.14 billion ringgit from 1.33 billion ringgit previously. In a filing with Bursa Malaysia, BIMB attributed the weaker performance to the impact of lower net financing income arising from multiple downward revisions of the overnight policy rate, OPR, and the recognition of modification loss due to moratorium exercise in April 2020. It said its banking arm, Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad's assets of portfolio quality remained strong as reflected in the low gross impact financing ratio of 0.7% as at 30th June, half of the 1.5% for the banking system as of end June 2020, while total gross impact financing stood at 371.5 million ringgit. 
Bank Islam reported an 11.1% lower profit before zakat and tax of 389 million ringgit compared to the corresponding period in 2019 due to lower net financing income arising from multiple downward revisions of the OPR and the recognition of modification loss due to the moratorium exercise. Pursuant to the moratorium on repayment of financing, the bank had recognized a modification loss of 97.8 million ringgit. The Takaful business, spearheaded by Sharikat Takaful Malaysia Keluarga Berhad, on the other hand, recorded a PBZET of 211.8 million ringgit for the first half of this year, on the back of lower operating revenue due to the lower sales generated from the family Takaful business. Still ahead, Turkey extends gas exploration in Mediterranean crisis. Now, the Spanish government says that children above the age of six in Spain will be required to wear face masks at school at all times as it seeks to restart lessons despite a surge in COVID-19 infections. Spain's 17 regional governments, which are responsible for health care and education, have in recent days outlined a patchwork of different measures, leading critics to charge there was a lack of coordination. The northern region of Cantabria's requirement for children as young as three to wear masks sparked a particular controversy. As well as mask wearing, pupils must also have to maintain a social distance of 1.5 metres from each other, except for young children who will be allowed to mix only with their classmates but not with outsiders. Other measures, including requiring children to wash their hands at least five times a day, regularly ventilating classrooms and taking pupils' temperature. Some parents, however, say they will refuse to send their children back to class because they fear it won't be safe. Spain's schools shut in mid-March when the country imposed a strict three-month lockdown to curb the spread of the virus and have not reopened since. The number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Spain, a nation of around 47 million people, surpassed 400,000 this week. Turkey extended its controversial Mediterranean gas exploration mission and scheduled new Navy drills as its row with Greece and the European Union over energy and borders threatened to spiral out of control. The Turkish Navy said it was prolonging the stay of the Orogrise research vessel and its accompanying warships in waters claimed by Greece by an extra five days to Tuesday. It also announced plans to hold gunnery exercises at the edge of its territorial waters in the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean next Tuesday and Wednesday. Defence Minister Hulusi Akar said the Shubting drills were not related to Turkey's fight with Greece over access to newly discovered reserves that could offer Europe a vast new source of energy and cut its dependence on Russia. But he also defiantly vowed to continue Turkey's various exploration activities in the east and Mediterranean region for as long as they are needed. The two NATO members have been staging rival war games in a conflict that could imperil Europe's access to vast new energy deposits and further destabilize a war on Libya and parts of West Asia. Meanwhile, an increasingly agitated Germany said ahead of an EU foreign minister's meeting on the crisis in Berlin that both countries had to end their naval maneuvers if they really wanted to a peaceful solution to the dispute. Russian President Vladimir Putin has called on the authorities in Belarus and the opposition to find a solution to the political unrest that has erupted over a disputed presidential election. Belarus has been hit by opposition protests since President Alexander Lukashenko claimed a sixth term in the 9th August vote that sparked unprecedented protests and was rejected by the European Union. 
EU ambassadors in Minsk yesterday condemned the prosecution of members of an opposition group calling for Lukashenko to resign and new elections. Putin previously warned EU leaders against interfering in Belarus and said Russia was ready to fulfill its obligations under a military alliance of former Soviet countries. Putin also told state television that he followed through on a request from Lukashenko to create a reserve group of law enforcement officers who could be dispatched to Belarus. The Russian leader conceded, however, that there were problems in the Belarus and added that he hoped the problems would be resolved peacefully. Lukashenko's notorious security services rounded up nearly 7,000 participants of peaceful rallies that erupted after he claimed some 80% of the vote, with hundreds of detainees claiming they were abused by police in custody. Violent protests broke out in a Johannesburg suburb following the gunning down of a disabled teenage boy, allegedly by South African police on patrol. An AFP photographer said a police fired tear gas, stun grenades and rubber bullets to repel hundreds of angry protesters in El Dorado Park, southern Johannesburg. Residents burnt tires and hurled rocks at the police, setting up barricades along the streets and damaging a local police station. The protests were sparked by the death of a 16-year-old boy killed the previous night. Petunia Julius, a sister to the slain teen named as Nathaniel Julius, told a local television newsroom Africa that police opened the fire after her brother failed to respond to questions due to his disability. Police spokeswoman Brigadier Mother Hello, Peters, meanwhile, said in a brief statement that officers had been deployed to El Dorado Park following violent attacks by residents who are allegedly accusing police of having shot and killed a 16-year-old boy on Wednesday evening. The National Police Watchdog is currently investigating the killing. Now, at least four people were killed by Hurricane Laura in Louisiana, and search teams may find more victims. But Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards said that the most powerful storm to make landfall in the U.S. state in living his living memory did not cause the catastrophic damage that had been feared. Hurricane Laura struck the coast of Louisiana early yesterday as a Category 4 storm. That's the second highest on the wind scale. It has since been downgraded to a tropical storm. Hurricane Katrina, which left 1,800 people dead in 2005, was a Category 3 storm when it made landfall. Only one storm has made landfall in Louisiana with wind speeds as high as Laura, the last island hurricane of 1856, which left hundreds dead. Satellite images reveal the immense size of the hurricane as it made landfall as a Category 4 storm overnight near the town of Cameron, close to the border with Texas, packing sustained winds of 240 kilometers an hour. The Atlantic storm season, which runs through November, could be one of the busiest ever this year, with experts predicting as many as 25 named storms. Laura is the 12th so far. Coming up in sports, at Manchester United's Paul Pogba tests positive for COVID-19. Stay with us. We begin with the local scene. The National Shooting Association of Malaysia, NSAM, plans to host two local competitions, either in September and November or October and December, as early preparations for next year's SEA Games in Vietnam. The two tournaments, National Shooting Championships and two Tun Hanif Trophy, will be held at the National Shooting Range in Subang, Slango. National shooting team manager Dato Musa Omar said NSAM had yet to decide on the suitable dates for the two tournaments as they still had to streamline the standard operating procedure for the hosting of the tournaments as stipulated by the authorities. He also said that NSAM would request to the Olympic Council of Malaysia, OCM, for the team rifle event to be contested at the 2021 SEA Games as he claimed that Vietnam planned to drop the event. Based on the provisional list, 
list, Vietnam plans to host 36 sports next year. They are football or futsal, athletics, aquatics, archery, badminton, basketball, boxing, canoe, cycling, dance, sport and fencing, among others. The 31st edition of the Sea Games is scheduled to be held in Hanoi from 21st November to the 2nd of December next year. Manchester United midfielder Paul Pogba has tested positive for COVID-19. France manager Didier Deschamps said the 27-year-old will have to self-isolate for 14 days. Elaborating further, Deschamps said Pogba will miss France Nations League game in Sweden on Saturday, 5th September, and the home game against Croatia three days later. However, the French manager said Pogba could be eligible for selection for Manchester United's Premier League opener against Crystal Palace at Old Trafford on 19th September. Now, Pogba will be replaced in the France squad by 17-year-old Rennes midfielder Eduardo Camavinga. The news will come as a blow to United, who will return for pre-season training next Wednesday. Aaron Wan-Bissaka is already set to miss the start of the pre-season training with a club as he undergoes a 14-day quarantine after returning from holiday in Dubai. Pogba's United teammate, Anthony Marshall, meanwhile, returns to France's squad and could make his first appearance since 2018 after a strong end to the season, which saw him score six goals in the final nine Premier League games of the campaign after the restart. Paris Saint-Germain paid a fond tribute to departing captain Thiago Silva, calling him one of the greats ahead of a reported move to Premier League side Chelsea. PSG president Nasir al khalifi in a club statement thanked Thiago and said that he will always be one of the club's greats and his legendary status will live forever. According to reports in Britain, Silva, 35, underwent a medical in London yesterday and is expected to sign a two-year deal with Chelsea. The Brazilian defender, who turns 36 next month, is set to bolster Frank Lampard's backline after eight successful years at PSG. He joined from AC Milan along with Zlatan Ibrahimovic in 2012, going on to play more than 300 times for the club, winning countless domestic honours and reaching this year's Champions League final. Silva could become the latest signing for Chelsea in a busy close season that has seen the arrivals of Timo Werner, Hakim Ziyech, Ben Chilwell and Malang Sar. The Blues are also interested in Bayer Leverkusen's rising star Kai Havertz. Meanwhile, former Chelsea striker Didier Drogba has been told he is not eligible to stand in the upcoming elections to be the next president of the Ivory Coast Football Federation. Along with three others, Drogba submitted papers to stand in the polls earlier this month. The FIF's Electoral Commission ruled that the former Chelsea striker did not fulfil its long list of eligibility criteria. His bid was rejected as two of the names he had submitted as his sponsors were ruled not to have the necessary authority to do so. Officials from the Ivorian club Africa Sport and a body representing referees AMAFCI had also backed the Federation's current first vice president, Sori Diabate. Different officials from the same organisation had also signed Drogba's papers with the FIF's commission ruling they were not authorised to do so. In the case of Africa Sports, a sporting club in Ivory Coast, the head of its football section had given his approval to Drogba while the chairman of the whole club had backed Diabate. It meant that Drogba only had the backing of two top-flight Ivorian clubs and not the three that FIF statutes demand. The rejection will come as a bitter blow to football fans in Ivory Coast, thousands of whom had come out to support him earlier this month when he submitted his bid to stand. And that's it from us this afternoon. In our top story today, Electoral Reform Committee submits 49 election reform recommendations. News at 10 comes on this evening on My Freeview's Barita RTM News Channel. I'm Mohana Priya. Have a great weekend.